again, Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6. If you need a Bible, again, slip up your hand and we'll get one over to you. Here at The Rock, we always encourage you to walk with your pen, your Bible, and your notes or pad where you can jot down your notes. But I know we're in electronic day, so um, also you can use your electronics to do what you need to do with the Lord. I pray that it's not a distraction, though, for you. Um, and so... The title of the message today is No Limit, No Limit. I think of how me going through school, high school and back, um, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't stand reading out loud, standing in front of people was not my thing as far as when it came to reading in the class and stuff like that. In high school, I, I did the bare minimums, whatever it took to get on um, the basketball team. So if I can just have the grades to play basketball, I was content. So that was like a 2.5 average, you know. I just wanted to do the bare minimums to play sports, you know. So when football season came around, did the same thing, you know. Um, the more sports that was available, then th that I would be pushing myself there. Other than that, when it was no sports season, you know, and if I was low in the grades, I, I was always trying to milk the teacher to give me some, you know, just some grace or whatever, you know. And, and I just think of, you know, looking back through high school, you know, I did the bare minimums until my last semester of my senior year in high school. I said, you know what, I'm going to try and make the honor roll. What a concept, right? It was too late, you know, if I was going to college, um, they were already looking at the grades from 11th grade or whatever, however they do that. However, I do recall missing the honor roll by one letter grade. Why? Because I applied myself. I took the limits off myself, right? But all before that, you know, it was just like I had limits on me. I just, oh, yeah, I'm not into that. I'm not interested. And foolish, you know, and a lot of things that I think back on just how time was wasted. I believe today God is calling us to take the limits off of our life. In many areas, God is calling us to take the limits off and allow him to work through us in ways beyond ourselves. You know, sometimes we want to just move in the comfortable space, you know, and, and we put limits on our life because we don't want to step out and allow God. It's interesting that uh, Matt has shared that verse from Ezekiel 47, but one of the interesting things in that that he didn't mention in that passage about going into the waters that he couldn't even swim in was this. The Lord was calling him out to those places. And so what you can know for sure is that when God calls you out into deep waters that you can't even swim in, the reality is this, is that you can rest assured that he's the one that called you out there. He'll never leave you or forsaken you in those places, but he will always seek for you and I to have a heart of dependency upon him in those places. And so, hey, today, again, take the limits off or no limit as the title of the message is. I know some of y'all are thinking about Master P, but that's not where this came from. This is strictly from just what God has pressed upon my heart. Last week, we covered verses 1 through 7 and understand this when you look at what was going on when the apostles when this complaint came from the Hellenists they told them hey it's not desirable that we should leave the word but we will give ourselves to prayer and fasting but what they told them to do the instruction or the solution to the problem was this they told them hey do this choose uh, seven men among you that's what the, the request was or the, the command was. And one of the things I think about this was in those verses, we didn't see that there was a requirement for skill. Did you notice that last week? But it, understand this. It was not for men to have be or skilled, but for men to be filled. And that was the key that we saw last week that men needed to have good reputation and character, but they needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we jump into this, understand in picking up in verse 8, I'll read it from my Bible, but in verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. 
Then there arose some from with, uh, with um, I'm sorry. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, um, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he, by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men by saying, we have heard him speak blasphemy words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemies were on blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. Today, if you're taking notes, we want to look at three things. The first thing is the miracles by Stephen. We see it in verse 8. The miracles by Stephen. The next thing we see is the malice against Stephen, and we see it in verses 9 through 14. And then we'll notice the meekness of Stephen in verse 15. The meekness of Stephen in verse 15. We said the first thing is the miracle that we find by Stephen in verse 8. And it says Stephen was full of faith and power. And he did great wonders and signs among the people. First thing that you want to note is what Stephen's name means. It means wreath or crown. It, it was the victor's crown that was known in those days. And, and it's interesting because a lot of times in the old times or in biblical times, your name had meaning to you. And it's interesting because today we don't really, you know, your name could mean, you, you probably don't even know the meaning of your name. You just know your name, you know. And, and so it, it doesn't have that kind of weight as it would back then. But it's interesting that Stephen's name means victor's crown. And we see here that in his life he had been a success, if you may. He had a short time that we see him on the scene as we go into next week and we start to walk through chapter 7. He preaches a phenomenal sermon in front of these folks. But understand, there's some things that are mentioned about Stephen. The first thing it says here is that he was full of faith. In other words, this is completely filled. And what the meaning is bringing out when you see this filled its meaning is is to be completely controlled by that's what it's saying here that Stephen was completely controlled by faith now one of the things to note in the better manuscripts the word translated faith here is actually charis grace and so one of the things that we could note here and that we learn is this though because last week we saw that he, they needed to be men that were of good reputation. They needed to be men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we've seen that he, Stephen, had wisdom. And so not only that in verse 5, we see that he was a man of faith. And so even as you look at the manuscripts, what you would see is that he, they wouldn't say he, you was full of faith here and then full of faith again. And so notice here what is interesting, as you see here, he's saying that he's full of grace and power. But he had faith. And he had faith to move forward in the things of God. And notice, although he was simply, watch this, a deacon. That's all he was. We would kind of look at it and say like, oh, you know what? No, he, that's the person that just deals with the physical things. But it is incredible because the statement says he was full of faith and power. And watch this. 
He did great things. What? Wonders and signs among the people. I, I find this interesting because he did. He did. What does that mean? It literally could mean or be translated is this, is that he was constantly performing great wonders and signs. There was these things that Stephen seemed to do that were surprising things among the people. The people marveled by them because of the miraculous workings of God through Stephen. And so when we look at this is, understand this, it wasn't luck. It was God. You know, people walk around, oh, you're lucky. No, I'm blessed. That was God that did that. And people want to cancel out God and say, oh, you just, that, that just was luck. No, that wasn't luck. That was God. And here was Stephen being used to be a blessing. And one of the things that we can note is even last week, and this is important because oftentimes what you will see in the scriptures is the name mentioned first probably is the person that was in charge or, you know, they, they, they were recognized. And Stephen is the first name that we see mentioned last week in the choosing of the seven men. I find this interesting because, look, understand, of seven men that are mentioned, he's chosen as or mentioned first among a growing church of over 8,000. So when they're saying, hey, choose from among you, and why does Stephen's name hits the fan saying, hey, you, you got to get that guy Stephen on your team. I, I don't know what, what was about him in his service and when his skill was, but it has nothing to do with that. And it had everything to do with the kind of character that Stephen moved in and the kind of faith that he walked in. And so when you think of this here, follow this. Stephen is mentioned as number one or first among the deacons, but he's also going to be recognized next time or as we go get to the end of chapter 7 as this. Watch this. The first martyr of the church. Wow. That God would use them in such a way, but then allow them to be martyred. Oh. What kind of cruel God is that? Here, look, follow this here and don't miss this because one of the things we learn about Stephen is that he had godly character. His character was intact. And when God chose him to step into this thing, and one of the things we know from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 is this, for those who serve well or have served well as deacons, we see it, obtain for themselves a good standing and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Stephen had definitely served well, and we'll see it as we move forward. But understand this for yourself. What are you controlled by? We said that Stephen, it says that Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled. What are you controlled by? What are you, when you think about your life, what controls you? Because look, understand this. When you're filled, there's no room for nothing else. You see, we, we want to be partially filled. We want to be kind of like what we would consider carnal. We want to kind of enjoy a partial filling of the Lord, but then we want to enjoy a partial filling of the world so often. And you see, hey, we desire or should desire to be filled filled by the Holy Spirit. That's why even in um, Ephesians chapter 5, it tells you in verse 18, be ye not filled with wine, don't be drunk with wine, but be ye continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, you can't, you know, don't, don't settle for less when you could have so much more. Take the limits off. Well, you know what? If I start walking in the Spirit, then people are going to think, you know, I'm just too radical or, or I'm just too extreme and all of this. My parents or my family is just going to think like, you know, you're just over the top. Oh, so it matters what they think about your walk, not what God desires for your walk. That's interesting, and you need to examine where you are with that because here we're either going to be controlled by our flesh 
but will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And here, as you consider, look, he was full of faith, he's full of the Spirit, and he's full of grace and power. What, what, what a tool, what, what, what an arsenal to have in your tool bag, amen? And so here, look, the grace of God comes through faith. Faith, I believe, is the, what we would consider the, the vehicle that here, as you see, even in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, you're familiar with this verse. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You see, so faith is the vehicle which, which um, grace comes by. And it says there, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should brag about it or boast about it. And so the question again, who are you? The effects of Stephen's life here we see is because of the, what I would consider the identity that we see in verse 5 about Stephen. He understood who he was. And we, are, we have to really consider who are we. Before we serve the Lord, who are we? Can you answer that for yourself? Can you answer that question for yourself today with confidence? I am this. With confidence, before any service, before anything else, who am I in God? Who are you? You need to write that down. You need to identify with that, and you need to come to a conclusion of who you are before any of those things. We must understand this. Stephen seems to know who he was, more so who God was in him. He had godly character, and although he was called to the physical responsibilities of the church, God still used him, watch this, in the supernatural. Here, Stephen being filled or faithful to or in the little things. And that's a real good question for us to examine for ourselves today. Are you faithful in the little things? Oh, no, I, I'm waiting for, for God to give me big ministry. What are you doing with the little things. Why are you looking for something grand when you're not even faithful in the small? You see, God is calling you and I to steward the little things. And well, how are you going to be responsible in those things? What has God invested in you? When you consider what God has vest invested in you, have you invested your personal into your personal relationship with Jesus what is the investment I know what, what God has given me as far as resources tools you know in, in in my character but what am I doing to invest in that for myself and you have to examine for yourself what are you doing to invest in your personal relationship with Jesus because he is calling you into something, we can tend, watch this, to assume, oh, we can't because, you know what, I, 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 don't, I don't think I can do that. Well, it has nothing to do with that. God may be calling you into something, just as we mentioned earlier, hey, where you know that you have to have total dependency on him. And you see, that's really where God wants us. But some of us got limit, have limits on our lives. We have borders. Oh, you know what? <laughs> nah, that, I, I don't have control. I'm, I'm releasing control into once I step into that. And so therefore, you know, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just stay right here. That's limits. Take the limits off. No limits. Here, look, understand this. As you consider this, we know some things here. And we understand that God... When he calls us to serve him, he equips us, he prepares us. And understand this, we can go forth in the fullness of his grace. Serving others in a way that others will know more than that it was you, but that it's God. God is working through you. If we desire to serve God effectively, we must conclude on this. Watch this. Understand, God will supply the power but we need to supply the empty vessel. Are you empty today? You see, God is wanting to empty us of self. And we must release that unto him so that he can fill us with the proper 
power to be effectively used in his purposes. Hey, understand this. And even for myself, I think about this, you know, in the small things. It comes to the small things. When I first got saved, about a year in, all I was doing was vacuuming the floors of the high, high school ministry down at the church I got saved in. I was just pull out the vacuum and, you know, and back and forth. And the, the teen center was humongous with a push vacuum. I ain't had no sit-down thing. It was no luxury to it. I couldn't use two of them. It was one vacuum up and down this carpet. Big teen center. And then eventually, as I continued to show up, and I remember they started, they used to bust in these, you know, troubled kids. And I started having these opportunities to connect with the troubled kids from the neighborhood, or, well, they was busting them in. And so from that, you know, opportunities came where I was able to, you know, start a ministry in the juvenile detention center. And there was little things that just continued to progress along the way. And so, you know, even this, we, when we started this, we never desired no church. We just wanted to reach broken people. People that were lost, we wanted to reach them. And just give them a hope in Christ. And just, you know, by time it becomes something like, you know, it, this is like, God's already removed that. You know, I remember early on, we, oh God, give us a building. But then there would be times like, you know what, that God just removes that from your heart. And then he's like, hey, you know what, now you, you, you want this opportunity? They're like, no. But it's just being faithful in the little things. And God will allow you more opportunities. And so, understand this. We need to settle our hearts in him and walk by his grace. The second thing we see is the malice against Stephen. And we see that in verses 9 through 14 and one of the things that we can identify is he says there in 9 it says then there arose from um from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen Cyrenians Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia there's this disputing with Stephen interesting God is using him to do miracles and here's what typically happens, the enemy is going to bring people that are opposed. So who is opposing? The people from the synagogues. Now look, understand this. This is the religious from all over. Here, there's this arousal that happens. These are, you know, the, and understand this, when you look at this passage, scholars are torn whether or not these are multiple synagogues or if it's just one that has these people groups within them. One thing we do know, though, is this, is there in Jerusalem was over or about, just about 500 different synagogues. And in order to establish the synagogue, all you really needed was 10 adults to gather or be considered a true synagogue. That's interesting because you know what? There was probably all kinds of disputes and disagreements or whatever um, that was happening. But one of the things we see here and where I kind of lean to is that there was probably three different synagogues and it's because of the people groups. But who were the freedmen? They were Jews from foreign countries who were most likely um, formerly slaves but had gained their freedom and, you know, had had the opportunity to now come back to Jerusalem. We see even in Jesus' story that, hey, there was Simon, who? The Cyrenian, remember? And here, understand this, Cyrenian and Alexandria, that was the North Africa area where Cilicia and Asia was where we would consider modern-day Turkey area, Asia Minor, as is known as in the Scriptures. But it says that there is this dispute that happens. In other words, that word could be translated a discussion or better yet, a debate that's happening. There's this debate that's going on and understand it seems like, hey, as Stephen was moving, hey, and there would be these disputes, hey, Stephen would just be bringing it right to them. 
hey, preaching Christ and him crucified. As you consider this here, understand this. When God is at work, seemingly religious people can be a problem in your life. They seem to be spiritual, but they could be probably some of your worst problems. You see here, look, understand this. When we consider Stephen just being used beyond, he took the limits off. Hey, I'm not going to just serve tables, but hey, when has I, these opportunities come, I'm going to be used of God. So Stephen wasn't the kind of guy that was, you know, well, I'm just going to be giving this food to people. I'm just going to be giving these resources to people. He seemed to be able to see beyond the physical need of the people that he was serving. It seemed to be that for him, it was, hey, you know what? I see you going through this. Here's something physical, but I see something deeper let me touch you right there and he was touching people and, and and being used beyond the holy spirit probably was prompting him hey step out there believe me trust me hey you know what be obedient to me as i lead you in that and so you know what i know this is your title i know this is your lane but understand this hey there's somebody broken right there go share a word with them encourage them hey there goes another person Hey, they need a challenge. Challenge them. Hey, there's somebody right there who needs a physical healing. Go touch them. And Stephen wasn't an apostle. Wasn't one of the quote-unquote greats, but he's a great. Here, look, understand this. As you consider this, why did they do this? Look, understand. In verse 10, it says, and they were not able to resist him. The, the wisdom and the spirit and I want you to see this it's the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke these were scholarly people Saul of Tarshish was most likely among these people here probably in this group but I, un I, I, I want you to consider this he was among the, uh, the, the scholarly people that were in this debate but he was the one that was anointed you know, I have a childhood friend of mine just recently said, you know what, he didn't go to Rhema College, but he had a Rhema word. That's the kind of thing that Stephen was about right there. Hey, he had a, a timely word for these people to recognize. And so when they tried to resist him, you see here, look, understand this. It's saying they were not able to resist him. They couldn't oppose him. They couldn't come against everything he broke down or shared. He weren't able to bring against him. And so note this, that the people opposing you may normally be resisting the Holy Spirit and not you. You see, sometimes people want to come against you, but you're taking it personal. But it's really not you they're opposing. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit in you. And we, meet, we need to remember this. And I wonder today, are you like Stephen? Are you able to speak the truth with boldness? Because that's what I think that, that we, as we look at this, Stephen addressed the issue head on. He didn't water it down. And we would say, oh, he, 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 he got him in a lot of trouble. Didn't you mention that he's, he, he's going to be martyred? Couldn't his ministry be so much more effective if he just kept his mouth shut? I disagree. Here, look, understand this. He understood that God was in control. And because God was in control, hey, you know what? God is in control of, of, of these things that I'm sharing and the outcome of them also. But here, look, Stephen was willing to deal with them head on. Where are you? Are you in the word and prayer seeking the wisdom of God? And can you identify with the spirit of God and what he is speaking and what he desires to speak through you when you're in a situation? Or are you just dependent on your flesh and your own knowledge? Here, look, understand this. As you consider this for yourself, and I, I, I'm just so encouraged by what John chapter 14, verse 26 says. It says, but the helper. It's good to know the Holy Spirit is a helper. Because you could be in some situations and you don't know what to say. And then here, look, understand. Then the, the Holy Spirit keeps good on his promise. 
It says here, Jesus said, hey, whom the Father has sent I, in, in my name, he will teach you all things and watch this, bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. It takes you and I sitting at the feet of Jesus. Hey, investing. You're wondering why you're reading that. Why are you, you know, in this area of the scriptures. But when you need it, it's going to be in you in the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a verse you committed to memory or any of that thing. But it's this. He brings it back to your remembrance. And that is what the helper does. He helps you in situations. Will you speak what he is telling you to speak? Or... Will you cop out and speak what your flesh wants to say in the matter? Here, look, Stephen didn't seem to move that way. Note this as you consider, and, and I can be honest even for myself, I can fail at this at times because I'm more concerned about winning the battle than the war. You see, sometimes you might be more concerned about Winning the argument. You can just start running in a, an emotional rabble, rabbit trail. Instead of God, what should I say about this? How, how, how should I address this? And here, understanding, hey, God is the one that wants to speak through the vessel. And so here we see in 11 through 14, what do they do? Really, they, we see the word four times in these verses. They, 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 and they. What did they do? Basically, in a nutshell, they lied. They are doing the most. They're doing, you know, and this is when you know you're in the flesh. When you have to do things secretly, you have to induce people as we see it here. They, they were inducing people. They were doing things in the dark. Note this, when you start doing things in the dark, to try to bring about some outcome in the light, you're working with the devil. You're working in the flesh. Because God is in the light. And so you don't have to work in, in you know what, I'm going to manipulate this. Hey, you know what? This, look, right, didn't he say this? Come on, don't, you, you remember, right? Come on, let's go over here. You don't have to do none of that. When you're working with God, you work in the light. But here, look, these, these folks are, are religious people. Don't forget that. They're in the synagogue. They're, they're, it's a gathering of Jewish worshipers. And what are they doing? Carnal things. He says, we have heard him speak blasphemies against Moses and God. Now, that down, this is interesting because it's saying that, hey, he was speaking these things. And they, as we see, were not only secretly bribing people, but they also were, this, this word defaming means, um, blasphemy means defaming or insulting or even slandering. It's what, what they were saying was, hey, what God is saying is sacred, Stephen is saying it's not. That's what they're basically bringing this accusation against him saying. And here we can see, because of their religious customs, they were more concerned about that than their relationship with God. And I find this interesting because one of the things you can note from this is, how do we know that? They were more concerned with their religious customs. Remember how I mentioned that Stephen's name was up on the top? You notice what you see there they mentioned? Whose name did they mention first? They said, in, in verse 11, they said, we have heard him bla um, speak blasphemous words against who? Moses. Why is it Moses before God? Because they were concerned about their religious practices, their customs. The, 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 this is the way we do it. You know, you, you know are, are you claiming to be spiritual? But it's so easy to make you move in the flesh. Here, you know it is not the Lord again when you're moving in the dark. But follow this, understand. You don't need to lie in secret. You don't need to try to work up some things in the private. You know, and maybe some of you need to be reminded about this now that tax season's coming up. Oh. 
Oh, you were going to make an extra claim, but, but, but you know what? You're stealing if you're doing that. Here, look, understand. It's tax season. You need to be honest with your taxes. We need to be honest. Here, look, understand. When you look at these folks, they're doing some things, but they're supposed to be spiritual. And I wonder today, are you stirring up people, lying on them, making false witness against them? And here, as you consider, what do you do when people falsely accuse you? You see the contrast? Hey, it's not only are you stirring up, but how are you when people accuse you falsely? You know, they, they said the one who throws the... the you know, who bark, the, when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one who barks the loudest is the one that got bit. And you can seem to be guilty by maybe your outrage. But here, look, understand. Or you can have self-control in the spirit. This is, this is really challenging us in the respect of how are we, because Stephen was an example, but there are people who are so caught up in their customs. We see that here. It says that they, you know, in verse 14, this is what they're saying. It's saying, we heard him say that this Jesus, you can almost hear their voices, right, in, in anger. This Jesus of Nazareth, you know, this place, you know, that, that is really, you know, they would throw that in there and speak about it because it was a poor place. It, this this Jesus, you know, uh, of Nazareth, he, he will destroy this place. But we know from the scriptures that, that Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. But he said, hey, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. And did he not do it? He did that. But here we also see here, they said, he, and he's going to change the custom which Moses delivered to us. You know what? If your customs are not surrendered to the Lord, then you need to reevaluate. There are people, we, you, we are, I'm a part of a movement. And you know what? So we, we can't change the customs of Chuck. Yeah, I said it. I want to follow the customs of God more than any man on this earth. And if that is God changing the customs, let God change the customs. But is it biblical? And that's what we need to examine. I need to surrender my trajectory on ministry and all of those things, my traditions and the way that ministry flows. I need to surrender that to the word of God. Well, you know, we always did it this way, and this is the way. You know what I'm surrendered to because I believe it before, you know, anything else. But this is what I embrace, that we are going to teach through the word of God. Line by line, precept upon precept, because I believe that's the best diet for the church. But you know what? There's some other things that God is going to just change because he's God. And I'm not. And I'm okay with that. And hey, as we walk with the word, hey, we need to... Give a defense through the word. Why we do what we do. Well, I'm not about mechanics, but I want to know what God is saying for us to do in this local place. I'm not saying for 100 churches. I'm saying here for us. What is God saying for us here in this place? And not just me, but even as our leadership comes together, seeking the Lord together and being on one accord in those things as we move forward. Well, we watched this last verse the meekness of Stephen as we come to a close. And it says, all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. Wow, what meekness. Look, they're looking steadfastly at him. They, in other words, they're, they're looking intensely at him. You imagine, like, this is the Sanhedrin, the, the council. They're sitting there, and they're, they're hearing what Stephen has spoken in times past, and now, you, you know, somebody just get on your nerves, you just, Rrr! you never been there? I know, you're so meek all the time. It's Sunday. I know you're meek now. 
But you ever been there? You just want to wring somebody's neck? And here, look, that, this is the, the tenseness here. And they're staring straight into probably trying to look right into his soul. Like, look, I just want to. Mm. <laughs> somebody probably thinking, I'm thinking somebody, right? <laughs> but look at Stephen's face. Look at the, how they identify Stephen's face. It says as, as one of an angel. Man, this is incredible because we know that angels are sent messengers. They're messengers, right? Here, this, though, could also mean, though, or have the idea of being faultless or fearless. And I think we can probably surmise that Stephen was all of the above. He was a messenger from God, and you know what? He had nothing to be charged of in God's sight. And then thirdly, we can see for sure he didn't have the fear of man on his face. But he had one that was shining like an angel, and that could even mean the, the presence of God was with him. Now, I find this interesting because just a little bit of Bible study, we can see here as Stephen's life is on the line, instead of defending himself, his face is shining like an angel. Now, I only see in the scriptures that I can remember three people that was like Moses, who they knew about. They were trying to keep his customs, right? They knew all about Moses. You can read about it in Exodus chapter 30. For where his face shined or shone, right? It was a, a glow on him. We also see that Jesus, when in the transfiguration, it says his face shined bright as the sun. Now you got Stephen, a deacon, on trial, who you would probably, oh, nobody. Oh, but he was somebody. Because his face is now shining. And perhaps, just perhaps, as he stood before these people who revered Moses seemingly more than God. Hey, you remember Moses? His face was shining? Here's another shining face for you. Moses, Old Testament. I'm co-signing the New Testament and what Stephen's preaching to you right now. You need to consider this here. Look, hey, because his face was shining. And I think God was putting his stamp of approval on this man's life as he took the limits off. I wonder in your life today, where are you? Are you taking the limits off? Are you God's messenger? What message is your face showing? Oh, I know, me, my, my face can give a, a, a lot of messages because I, I wear my emotion, feelings on my sleeve, like... If I got an angry face, that's how I'm feeling. Some people walk around, they, they face just look angry, but they're not angry. Oh, when my face is like that, you know, I'm because I don't know how to do this when I'm feeling. I just don't. And, and so I'm not going to try and fake it to make it, but that's what's going to be there. But what message is your face giving off? And you have to consider that. Because... God wants to shine through your life. And you don't need to fear when you're in front of these groups, whether they're opposing you or even for you. Hey, you're on God's team. And you're, okay, you're going to be okay. But you should shine. I'll leave you with this. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, it says... If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Remember that. Hey, you know what? You can walk because the spirit of glory is resting on you. In this one more verse in Philippians 2, 15, it says this. It says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked, I mean crooked and perverse generation among whom you look, watch this, that's today, 
whom you shine. You shine as light in this world. In this world, in this dark and crooked, perverse generation, I am encouraging, I'm challenging you, hey, shine bright as the sun for the glory of God. Father, we thank you for your living word today. And as we conclude this time together, we just want to give you thanks for your faithfulness. We think of what you have done in our lives and what you have called us to. And we pray today that there would be a true surrender, a true surrender of our will. You would cause us to surrender self so that you could fill us with power. We need power. We need your grace. We need the fullness of your Holy Spirit. We need to function through the vehicle of faith. Lord, would you help our unbelief today? And if there's anyone that has come to know you today, I pray that they would know you first as the resurrection and the life, Lord God. I pray that they would know you to have resurrection power. You have conquered the grave for our sin, Lord God. And we thank you for the gospel, Lord God. We don't no longer have to be slaves of sin because you have paid the penalty at Calvary. We honor you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.